Hey everybody, welcome to the book leads impactful books for life and leadership. I'm your series host and leadership performance coach, John Jermillo, and this series is about getting to the books that have impacted the people in my network, friends, coworkers, colleagues, uh, new and old. I want to get to the great leads, the great people that have interesting takes on the books that have impacted them the most. So I want to get to those books that have influenced them in terms of their life, their business, their work, whatever it may be, all those worlds intersect. So the three categories of books that I cover on the series are category one, where they're sharing a book with me that I haven't read. Category two, where we're covering a book we've both read, whether specifically for the series or from our past lives. Category three is when I have the author and or publisher on to talk about the message of the book that they're sharing that they want to get out to the masses. So in this particular episode, my guest is Dr. Hiba Khaled. And Hiba is a co-founder of Embers a consulting and coaching firm helping individuals and organizations recover from burnout to achieve healthy high performance. With a background in medicine and leadership training at Harvard under the mentorship of Ron Heifetz and Tim O'Brien, she has dedicated her career to helping individuals and organizations achieve success from a place of health. A survivor of burnout herself, Hibba is on a mission to balance performance with well-being. When she's not busy transforming lives, you can find her out in nature, drinking tea, or diving into a good book. And Hiba had reached out when she heard about the series, um, how I go about working with my guests to get those messages out of the great books that they want to share. We got to talking, traded stories back and forth, experiences, and I, I found her insights, her background interesting and wanted to invite her on for the series. So Hiba, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So first of all, if you could, who are you today? Uh, can you provide a little more about the work that you're doing today? I want to get some insight into my guest and the work that you do, just so people have a good grasp of who's sharing the book and lessons with them. Yeah, no, I'm, so I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I started my entrepreneurial journey a year and a half ago, I guess, um, or just almost two years ago now. Um, but we officially launched the company last March, so we're, we're exactly one years old. Congrats. And Happy birthday. Thank you. And prior to that, I was a physician and an educator. Um, I was an anesthesiologist by training, and then I taught both medicine and leadership at Harvard. And yeah, it's been it's been a journey to kind of get here. But now I help people and organizations recover from and prevent burnout and foster healthy, high performing um, environments and organizations. So that's kind of the work that I do now, um, based on like the wealth of experience that I've brought in from my other work. And so when it, when it comes to your company, what is it? Um, I'm assuming one-on-one, -on -one. is there some group coaching, uh, workshops, webinars? What is it? How is it that your company sets up its services to your clientele? Yeah. So we have both, um an individual level type program so a one-on-one -on -one coaching with individuals and our like clientele are basically anyone who is in a highly stressful job or is kind of like high achiever who's looking to have a little more balance in their life um because what we tend to often see is that um the high achievers tend to burn themselves out because they're are type A personalities who are overachievers, and then um, they tend to prioritize their dreams over their well-being. And so, what we we help individuals on that level in one-on-one -on -one coaching capacity, where we help them achieve the elusive work-life balance and and maintain their ambition at the same time. Because when I was a Position, I felt like I had to choose between my ambition and my well being, which is not actually necessarily true, but that's what ends up happening more when we're under um, a lot of stress is that we feel like our options are limited. So, what we help people do is build their capacity to see more options available to them. And within organizations, um, so the business to business, or when we work in with organizations, we um, we do both kind of a hybrid model of uh, we assess the employees that work within the organization um, in different phases. So in phase one, we assess employee well-being 
through like a through a, an assessment that we've created mm -hmm. and then but the way we present the data is an, an, at an aggregate level so what's happening within the team rather than what's happening within the individual themselves and obviously the individuals will get their own uh, feedback on their own uh, assessment so that they see where they are personally but when we present it to at an organizational level we present it as an aggregate result to give like a snapshot of what's happening within the organization in this moment in time. And then we do consulting work with them to try and identify the root causes that are specific to this organization or to this team um, that are contributing to uh, burnout amongst their employees. So whether, and burnout manifests differently in the work in the organizational level versus the individual level. Um, and at the organizational level, it's things like um, reduced productivity, decreased engagement, uh, more sick days, and loss in profitability. Um, so that's kind of the metrics are a little bit different on the individual level versus the organizational level, but we do both. And then we do uh, workshops with organizations as well to based on like they're customizable workshops based on the organization's needs. Eva, I mean, so much stands out on what you just shared, especially because of, um, especially because of the pandemic, everything that's gone on with work and people just being burnt out and uh, having those commitments when there was social distancing of job and then also making sure that their families, friends, whoever it may be was okay. Um, so now there is kind of like it was always there, but there's this resurrection of the the phrase, the terminology, the term of work life balance. Can you speak to what it means to you? Um, only because I have my own take on it, and I'm curious in in this type of work, what does that look like to you? Is there such a thing as work life balance? Is it more fluid? What What are your thoughts on that? Mm, I love this question, and surprisingly, I've never been asked that. <laughs> So this is my first time that I'm answering it, I guess. Um, Work-life balance to me, I, I think in order to have a fulfilling life, uh, we need to feel fulfilled both in our the impact that we're making in the world, which usually comes through our work, and in the life that we're leading outside of work. Um, I remember when I was a physician, I or, or a practicing physician, no one took away my medical degree, <laughs> But um, when I was a practicing physician, I felt like I had all the purpose in the world. I was going into work with very clear intentions and uh, about the impact I was going to make each day. So like I didn't, I wasn't short of um, my purpose, if that makes sense. Like I was pretty yeah. clear on why I was going into work each day. And each day provided me with a lot of fulfillment in terms of the kind of cases I was doing, the patients I was seeing, the camaraderie I was feeling with my colleagues. And it was a shared sense of purpose, which gives even greater meaning to life. Um, so in that sense, I didn't feel, I felt fulfilled in my work, technically. But what I felt was missing was fulfillment in my personal life or in my life outside of work, because all I had was work. I was just working nonstop. I was thinking about work. I was a resident at the time, so I was also studying for board exams, not sleeping much, you know, doing all the things that like, I just felt there was no balance in, in the way I was living because it was all, con my work was all consuming. Um, whereas now when, when, and I remember just feeling like I cannot imagine my next, the next 35 years of my life in this way. Like, I can't imagine that this is all there is to life. Like I, and I think it's a common perception of healthcare workers, especially, or people in altruistic type work where they feel like, oh, if I'm helping others, then that's enough for me. But it didn't feel enough for me. Like I felt like I, I can't sacrifice my life for the, like, for the impact that I'm trying to make. You know, it, I don't feel good. I, and when I, when I first started medicine, I felt like, well, actually, it was a little bit. When I first went into medicine, it was for the actual um, reason to help people. Um, 
But then when that didn't feel, when it felt like it came at a huge cost, personal cost, it felt like, uh, is it worth it? Like, I, I'm sure there are other ways I can help others that don't cost me, where the cost to me isn't so high. So for me, the work-life balance or like my definition of work-life balance is kind of like what I'm doing now of like, I'm doing a job that's highly fulfilling. I feel I'm making impact in the world. I, I'm still fulfilling my sense of purpose. And I think realizing that my sense of purpose doesn't come from one particular role and it can actually be fulfilled in many, many different roles and many different ways was a really, really helpful thing to learn. And I learned that from the book that we're going to talk about. Um, and, and to also realize that my sense of fulfillment also comes from spending time with people I love and my family and my friends and, and from surfing and from reading books and from writing and, and actually realizing that I'm a multidimensional being with mm. multidimensional needs and I cannot be fulfilled if I'm only putting all of my time and energy into one thing that I need to tap into the different facets of who I am to have the like balance that I'm seeking and the fulfillment that I'm seeking. And I think that's what the work life balance is for me. Yeah. I love the way that you put that. Um, what I enjoy the most about how you put that was the multifaceted part, meaning you have that the term of work life balance where people may think it's like, okay, work and life, I just got to make sure those two things balance. And they may think, I think a, a lot of people use it in the in the the context of thinking, because that's where it comes up most of the time is work versus family, work versus home life with your family. I think the the majority of the conversation looks like that, but bringing up that multifaceted part brings in all these different components. Um, like me, myself, I have my work, I have my business, uh, I have my home life. Um, but it's not as simple as, as just those pieces. It's not those pieces of, um, your purpose, your security, you know, your paycheck, whatever it may be in your family. But there is also like what you said, you're writing, you're reading. For me, it's like photography, music. Um, I feel that helps with my overall anxiety is if I, if I sense that anxiety, it means I need something. I'm deficient in something, whether it's the intellectual, the emotional, the physical, whatever, the spiritual, whatever it may be. So I, it's like all those multiple facets of who you are. So it's interesting for me, it's not just the work and, and home, but all these other pieces that make up who I am. So if I have this curiosity about something in the world and I can't see it through, I can't go investigate, it, it comes back and it haunts me just because for me, I'm uh, just as an example, I'm doing good at work or I'm doing good in business. My family is secure. It's like, okay, then what? Like everything is taken care of. Where is like this other energy that I might have that I have to burn off. So I appreciate it. It's so important for people to realize it's not just work and what you have at home, but it's like what you need to do for yourself, whether it's walking, reading, music, okay. jogging, running, sports, whatever, working out, whatever it may be. I think that's a, a great point to highlight. Yeah. And I, I also want to say um, the work-life balance, people assume it's like 50-50. Like it must be like 50, like, I'm picturing a scale and it has to be evened out, you know, where it's like 50% work, 50% life. And actually that's not how it works. I think at least not in my mind, I feel, I feel like, um, or in my experience actually with clients, it's, it's not about balancing the scale and making sure that it's 50, 50, but if we're spending eight to nine hours, 10 hours at work each day, then that's like, you know, a good much chunk of our time, at, at like at work and actually we're probably spending like two-thirds of our lives at work for a certain many number of years um so maybe it's like 60 percent 70 percent goes towards work but it's it's more about like when we think about um 
ourselves at work and we're feeling stressed at work, we're often thinking about like maybe the things we're not doing with our life. Like it might be like, I'm at work right now and things are stressful and things are happening and I'm missing out on my mother's birthday or my niece's birthday or whatever, you know, and I'm mm -hmm. not actually engaging in this um, activity because I'm here at work. And so then I'm actually not even fully present at work because I'm feeling resentful about things that I'm missing out on. And, and a lot of the work that I do now is about trying to get people to just be more present with wherever they are while they're doing the thing that they're doing. And what ends up happening is when you are more present at work, for example, like I'm going to, I know I'm going to be at work for, um, from eight to five, for example. How can I make that time at work mean something and and count for something? It's like when I go to the gym, um, I don't go to the gym very often. I go to the gym four times a week. I don't go for very You'll go often. very often. You go four times a week. <laughs> I mean, okay. I mean, it's not like it's not like I, I for you, call, for your own threshold. I mean, I wouldn't call myself a gym rat or anything, but it's like say I'm going to the gym four times a week. It's not every day. So I still have three free days. Um, so it's almost half the week I'm not going to the gym. Um, and I don't go for too long, like 45 minutes to one hour max. But like for those 45 minutes to one hour, I'm so focused on every rep that I'm doing at the gym. So I'm tiring myself out while I'm at the gym. And I, it's not like I'm procrastinating while I'm there. I'm actually like I'm pushing hard for mm. every rep that I'm doing, knowing that at the end of the 45 minutes to an hour, I'm done for the day. I don't have to think about the gym anymore and I feel good. Like, and it's like, while I'm at the gym, I'm fully there while I'm at home. I'm fully there while I'm at work. I'm fully there. And it's like, when I'm, when I'm in that state of presence and actually, um, doing the thing, being present with the activity or people or task that I'm doing, then I can't be somewhere else. Therefore my anxiety doesn't exist. Because if I'm, if I'm like working hard and focusing on this specific thing that I'm doing, or I'm hundred percent with you right now, I can't think about, I can't ruminate on the past and I can't worry about the future. See, I think that's a big piece that people don't factor into burnout. Like mm -hmm. any discussion I've ever heard of burnout, I've never heard it put quite like that. I've always heard, okay, I, I work too much. I put work in front of everything. My relationship suffered. But the way that you just put it in terms of even if I, I can burn out, even if I'm at work and I feel bad about not being there for my family, that is also burnout. So it's not just the work that you're doing over and over again, burning all your energy. There's all that the mental piece of it as well in terms of I'm missing out on my mom's birthday or any of the events that you spoke to. So I think that's a good piece for people to to remember is that being present Um and that's huge. I think we hear that all the time, but I wonder how many people actually feel that sensation of being present, doing something, getting into flow and just being lost in what you're doing, whether it's a workout, whether it's a podcast, whether it's playing an instrument, where do you get lost where you're not focusing on regrets from the past or anticipating with anxiety the future? And it's funny, I took a break between season two and these episodes that are coming out now. And it was maybe two months that I was away from the podcast and I missed it. Like this to me is therapeutic. This mm -hmm. to me is just, it's like an alchemy that happens between my guest and I, where we're talking about ideas, having conversations that when I stand up, I'm not thinking about anything else. It's just this conversation. When I stand up, I'm energized and it makes me better for everything else that from here through the rest of the day. So I never thought about burnout in that capacity. Like, where's your mental, where's your head when you're in something? So mm -hmm. just because you're at work working hard, don't forget about the, it's not just the work you're doing, but also the mental of being worried, being sad about what you're missing, being resentful for having to be at work. So yeah. being present, that's huge. And I don't think I've, I've heard it put quite like that when I've heard burnout. So thank you for putting it that way. Yeah, of course. And and the other thing too, like if you think about actually how our work days are structured, like for most people who work in corporate or in 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 pretty much any organization, even non for profit, um, the thing like the thing I hear from a lot of burnt out workers is like, 
we have so many meetings, we have so many things, like everyone has a huge to-do list, even at work, right? And there's not a lot of time for deep focused work. Like I remember in one of my jobs a few years ago, we just had meetings all the time. We would have meetings to talk about the tasks that we needed to do, but we didn't have much time to actually complete the tasks because we were constantly meeting to talk about the tasks. And so it was really frustrating because I, I work really well in the morning. So my most productive time of the day for like things that require my full like cognitive capacity is in the morning. Um, I do my morning meditation. I'll go out for a walk. I'll get some like vitamin D, you know, mm -hmm. these are the things that I do in order to stay grounded. And then I'll make sure that I'm starting my work and then um, just trying to get like fo deep focus work for two to three hours. In that time, I can achieve a lot. And then my afternoons, I'm not as, I'm not as, uh, my flow state isn't as, as good during the afternoon. So that's when I usually book meetings because I can have a conversation with someone. So I'll try to keep my mornings free of meetings because I, I know that for me personally, I work best in the morning mm -hmm. and then creatively I work best at night, but my afternoons, I'm like, okay, how can I make the most of my afternoons where it's not like. I'm not not working, but it's mm -hmm. like I can have meetings in the afternoon if I need them or and there's obviously exceptions to that where I do have some morning meetings because my business partners in Singapore and our time difference like requires me to have morning meetings with her. But that's fine because I can anticipate that ahead of time. Um, but it's just like the way we work, even at work, there's constant distractions. There's constant. Um, we're constantly thinking about like a hundred things and not just like the one thing that we need to do today. And so a lot of the work I do with clients is trying to just optimize the way we work so that like you do, when you do focus and do deep work and like kind of just adjust the way we work, even within the constraints of the hours that we work, we can be way more productive and achieve just as much, if not more in a shorter amount of time. And like, I've proven that with, myself as a proof of concept and like with other clients who see the difference once they start implementing these small changes. Yeah. I've seen so many clients where they'll show me their calendar and it just looks like you took different colored clays and just kind of mixed them all together and just laid them out flat on a table. Every nook and cranny is filled and I've been to obviously my own meetings. I've sat in on some of those meetings. And there's just so much about them that can be more productive, more efficient. I think meetings are just the bane of existence. Mm. If they're not done correctly, I think there's a lot of people that have that misconception that the busier their calendar looks, the busier they look, like it's a status symbol, like a badge of honor that I'm so busy. Look at all these meetings I have. And there's and a lot of those people. They're booked throughout the day. So then they go home, they have dinner with their family, they tuck in their kids, and then they're up until midnight, you know, from from eight to midnight or one o'clock doing the actual deep work because they were booked in all those meetings throughout their day and weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's insane. We we have a meeting epidemic in this country. I, I don't know about the rest of the world. I, I think as with everything else, they're probably way ahead of us in terms of meetings, but um yeah, they're 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 pretty bad. I think I think it makes um, I think it makes people feel like they're being productive, or like we're doing something, we're talking about something, and yeah, often yeah, it could have been an email or <laughs> <laughs> the number of the number of times I've sat in an email, looked around at the executives and said, "This is like, this is like a, a twenty thousand dollar." meeting right here with all the people that are sitting in here for this long and it could have been a memo it could have been a meeting uh it could have been some kind of recording that people can watch whenever they have time i i think we have to get more creative with that but um no thank you for everything you shared about uh the work that you're doing is there anything else you want to share i know i i kind of jumped in and hijacked you on work balance no no work -life it's balance. fine it's absolutely fine i think yeah i think um one thing, I don't know if it's relevant, but I'm going to share anyway, because it's been prevalent in my world in the last week, especially I keep hearing 
like I keep coming across this concept of anxiety and like people not being able to regulate their nervous systems, even like with uh, in both a social setting and both a, a, in um, a professional setting, like where I've had, you know, I went out for, with some friends this weekend just to the park because it was like nice weather and and then the number of my friends who are saying to me, like, I'm really struggling to regulate my nervous system, or I've heard that from CEOs and executives of companies also being like, I'm struggling to manage my team. And then I ask them about how they're managing their own anxiety and nervous system. And I'm just realizing that this is like such a big struggle for a lot of people. And it really starts there. Like if, if we can't um, regulate our own nervous system, we cannot manage a team effectively. We cannot manage our systems effectively, whether it's like your system at work or your team at work or your system at home. Or like, what is the ecosystem within you first before you can think about the ecosystem outside of you? And that's like a lot of the, I'm excited. I'm really excited. I mean, it's not, I'm not excited about the fact that people can't. <laughs> I was going to say, you're excited for people's anxiety. <laughs> No, I'm not excited about the fact that like people are sharing this with me, but I'm excited about the, um, yeah, something that has come out of it for me. Like, I'm like, how can I be of service for someone who's, who's struggling to manage their nervous system? Mm -hmm. And I'm creating something now that I'm excited to share in the next few weeks um, about like how to help people regulate their nervous system so that they can like manage their internal ecosystem um so that they can function better within the external ecosystem so yeah, I'm excited. I, I think i mean i always had that underlying problem growing up but the pandemic brought it to a head kind of made it rear its ugly head just because you know as a parent in a household the pandemic hits you have two kids at that time we have three now the uncertainty in the world what does it mean what does it mean being you know as a father of the family um but I think it's good that people are talking about that. I don't think, I think what stands out is that we're talking about it. Mm -mm. I don't, I don't think what stands out is that it exists. I think it is meant to exist. I think it has been in our system. I think it's always going to be in our system in our foreseeable future in the next couple of generations, probably millennia, but just that nervous system, that system of stress, the fight, flight, freeze, um, I just think that's always going to be there, but I think we're more prevalent in talking about it and mm -hmm. we can open up to each other about it. For me, I don't know, talking about, I think the biggest stressor of having that was keeping it to myself, was not sharing it with others. Cause the more that I talk about it, it's just, I'm not coping with it. As I've said in this series before, I think it's not something we cope with to me. Cope makes it sound like it's something foreign that's invading us. I think it's just part of our system and it's something that we live with. It's something that we, yes, I think regulate is the right word, but I don't think coping is the right word because it's not something foreign that's going to leave us anytime soon. I know for me, just my case, it's very much writing takes care of it. Working out takes care of it. Playing music takes care of it. Reading takes care of it. Hiking takes care of it. I just yeah. think that's all, it's all pent up energy from our primal days where society, what we have, the safety of our houses, technologies evolved so much quicker than our minds have, but mm -hmm. we're still in that state. We just, I, I saw something on LinkedIn today about the power of walking and how ideas, I think it was in the New Yorker, something about the power of walking, how, how that when you're walking, you get up and walk, better ideas come to you. Mm -mm. I mean, without even thinking of science, to me, it just makes sense because it's in our DNA. If we're sitting down doing nothing, we don't know what's going on around us. Okay. Picture creatures around. I'm talking thousands of years ago. We don't know who's around us, what's around us, what threats are around us. As soon as we get up and move around, okay, now we're on the prowl. Now we're looking around. Now we're monitoring and surveying our landscape to see what what's what's possible what isn't possible what's a threat what is it we don't have to deal with those threats the way we used to hundreds and thousands or thousands of year, years ago but we still have that programming yeah, so if, yeah. if we don't have anything that really meets us like our bodies are meant to fight threat if we don't have anything that really physical threat 
brings it to, to our doorstep, all that energy just kind of percolates inside of us. So, I mean, I just see it in so many, so many different, um, just like this network of ideas of what plays into it. But uh, yeah, it'll be fascinating to read about what your findings are, what you're going to put out and, you know, the coming months and, and whatnot. Yeah. And I, I just want to speak to a point that you mentioned like a little earlier in this conversation is sure. the fact that you're like a father and you have in, in parenting in the pandemic brought about a different kind of stress and anxiety than not not during a pandemic and and i think it's wonderful that you're not only just like t talking about it like you're um doing something about it because um historically men are tend to be more stoic like traditionally like the idea of masculinity it's like i'm the provider i'm the protector i'm bringing order to the family in the patriarchy you know like the yeah kind of historically and traditionally this is the systems that we grew up in it's the system i grew up in with my father i wrote about this yesterday actually i wrote a linkedin post about this yesterday because because it's a huge motivator for me in my work it's like I witnessed, I, and I think men struggle with this more than women because women traditionally, again, um, in history and historically, we've had more uh, community. Like women are are tend to. I'm generalizing. Absolutely, very, absolutely. I'm generalizing yep. right now, but historically and traditionally, women have had um, more tight knit communities that they could like where they could be more vulnerable and and share more of their struggle with other women and had support groups in place where like um, women raise children together as a community rather than like single households. And we're moving away from that. We're definitely moved away from that in current Western society. It still exists in many other places around the world, but that sense of community tends to be stronger for women than men. And I think it isolates men in their struggle. And I noticed that in retrospect, like when I look back on my my upbringing mm -hmm. and seeing my dad holding the stress, he had seven kids and he was a refugee and a doctor and an um, immigrant and all of these things that added stress to his life. But he didn't have an outlet the way my mom did, for example. And And I think, well... He definitely, uh, his stress manifested in disease. It manifested in high blood pressure in his 40s. It manifested in two heart attacks. The second one, like costing him his life, you know? And, and I think that could have been preventable had he had um, somewhere to express his stress in a healthy way or like an outlet of some sort that and like, you know, he did all, my dad was healthy in a lot of ways, especially after retirement, he took very good care of him, his health. But for many, many years leading up to retirement, his health was like an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And I learned so much from my dad. He was my hero. You know, he inspired me a lot in my work. He was also a doctor and like, we have a lot in common and he encouraged me and supported me in many ways. Um, and I learned so much about the impact one person can make from him on the world. But what I also learned from his death was the importance of prioritizing our health in order to have um, long, healthy, fulfilling lives where like as a daughter, my dad died at 29. I, I wish I had more time with him. You know, I, I don't have kids yet, but when I do, I'm sad they won't know him. Like yeah. personally, obviously they'll know of him, they'll hear about him, but they won't ha have the opportunity to play with him. And I feel like a little sad about that, to be honest, you know? Absolutely. So like, and so now I look at my brothers who have families of their own and I'm like, I don't want that for your kids. You know, I, I know you carry the same weight that my dad did with our family, but it, it means a lot to me to have my brothers live long, fulfilling lives so that they can enjoy time with their own grandkids one day. And, yeah. and to be there for their kids longer than my dad was for us, you know? And it's not to put blame or anything on 
anything is just try and really bring light to the idea that men tend to struggle alone and i i mm. and i want to change that no and i appreciate that uh as somebody who has had his struggles um for all the reasons you said like traditional societal traditional uh culturally traditional like my parents are from colombia so you know it's very latin men macho bs stoic um but what's great about what's going on these days is that you we're breaking those generational chain trauma chains meaning we're not addressing it the same way that our parents addressed it or my father specifically in this case of you know men um and i've mentioned it here before in this series where i had a lot of uncles i had a lot of my dad's friends who the men who were alcoholic mm. uh i'm not saying it's the main driver of that at all but i could see that kind of being an escape where they don't have somewhere to turn to do that it's funny just thinking of like all the primitive the primitive um roles traditional roles that men played um where they were the head of the family or the head of the pack you know depending on how far back you're going the provider and then getting to a point where they're no longer that necessarily obviously women are doing much more these days just as much as men in some cases more uh so it's it's a very interesting time for men and on top of that there is this stigma where if you if men do say that they have concerns if men do say they need help some people may see that as taking help away from somebody else mm -hmm. so it's very tricky it's a very tricky tricky topic i don't want to hijack this conversation with that but i appreciate that you can appreciate it just seeing it in your family history um, I wish I had more time with my family. Uh, I think we were like kind of in survival mode, being a family, loving each other, but I didn't really get to know my dad the way that I want my kids to know me or, you know, I've already had, because of the culture barrier from me to my dad, and there's no culture barrier between me and my kids, we were both born in this country. I can relate to my kids more. I, I, I've had more conversations with my kids than I ever had with my dad. Mm -hmm. So it's just very different, but I'm glad that that's taking place that way they have a better example of you know i can tell them listen if you feel a certain way share it find somebody you trust share it come to me because so much of my life was guided by that inability to share so they need not safety from obstacles or challenges or hazards like they have to live a tough life not have to but um they shouldn't be their world shouldn't be overly sanitized but if there's any safety that i can provide uh, security that I can provide mostly mentally even just talking things out I'm all for it just because I understand its power and that's amazing it's amazing because all it takes is one person in the family to heal to heal generations before us and generations after us and to to realize that for many of us and, and I don't want to like take away from um like the actual struggle of of a whole people in terms of depending on where they are geographically in the world or what kind of circumstances they're growing up in. But for at least us here, um, we have a choice. Like we have a choice to um, just be aware of the, of the ways that we were impacted as children in the way that manifests in our adulthood and, and decide, okay, we can continue to unconsciously um, repeat these patterns or we can become aware of them and make a different choice for for ourselves and our families and our children you know and i think that's really wonderful because all it takes is one person in the family to do that absolutely look at that we went deep yeah right out right out of the gate um Hiba, if you could now that you gave us a good uh idea of what you do today can you tell us where that started what were the the first couple steps you took into weather education into the workforce what did that development of a career look like and why and then kind of just give us the highlights of your steps to now yeah like i mentioned before i was a physician i wanted to i i didn't want to be a doctor to begin with my dad my dad actually discouraged me from becoming a doctor because he said it would be stressful and he was right <laughs> and he thought i could maybe have an easier life doing something else but um and at the beginning 
since I was a child, I didn't want to be a doctor either, actually, because I, um, everyone told me I'd be a doctor like my dad, and I wanted to prove everyone wrong. But then I went to med school and became an anesthesiologist. So, um, so what was it that between their mess, everybody's messaging and your dad's messaging of don't do this, was it kind of to go against that and say, no, I'm going to do it because no, you're pushing actually, on it? Or what, what yeah, was it that did drive you to medical school? It was, it was actually a volunteer experience. So I ended up, um, I knew I liked science. I was always good at science. I liked science and maths and, and I, I'm Middle Eastern. So I come from a family of like, be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. And so I knew that science was something that I enjoyed um, learning about and also where you can make a lot of impact in the world. And I, I witnessed my family making an impact in the world. Like my dad was a doctor in a rural village and he, I saw the patients and how they responded to him and how generous he was with his time, not just professionally, but personally also. And um, I don't know, I grew up in a very generous family in terms of like, just so giving. And um, I grew up with kind of that value of like, be of service, be of service, be of service. And so I think, in some ways I was conditioned to like want to do a career that was going to be of service to someone or to people in a, to make a positive impact in the world. And we also grew up with, um, with the mindset of like, make sure you help others in need. Like I come from a family of refugees. Um, my dad didn't grow up with much, you know, they had to leave their homes uh, when he was two years old and live in a refugee camp. So he grew up in a refugee camp and didn't have much money. They could only send one of their kids to school to begin with. Um, so they chose my dad when he was of age to go to university to send him there to do med school because he did well in school. And, but so this whole idea, and then I witnessed my father helping my cousins um, later on with their education because his brothers helped him with his education. You know, it was just always this like pay it forward kind of mentality. Um, but I didn't like being told what to do. So when people said, you're going to be a doctor, just like your dad, just because you're smart, I thought like, no, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to forge my own path. But then in 2006, I was in my, the summer between my third and final year, you know, in my, of my undergrad, I did, um, like a volunteer trip to Costa Rica and Nicaragua. And it was like a medical mission trip where uh, at that time, the healthcare system was on strike. And so a lot of the clinics were closed or did, people didn't have access to like primary care clinics. And so we set them up in through an organization um, in churches and community centers, um, just in places where people could access like a, a doctor or a medical student. I wasn't, I was neither. I was just like a science student. And, but we did like a cross cra uh, crash course in um, like medical Spanish and just like history. <laughs> a crash course in medical Spanish. I've never heard that. I don't think I'll ever hear that phrase again. But okay. Yeah. And then a crash course in like how to take a history from a patient how to do a basic examination and then how to relay that back to the doctor who's like gonna like the volunteer doctor who's with us so in that trip I was away for a couple of weeks and we set up all these clinics and then I was able to see firsthand the impact that we were making with like patients in rural communities and it was incredible because I it, just to see the small intervention that you make that would make a huge difference to someone's life for example, there was a six-year-old boy who was complaining of headaches and he kept saying, like, I have these constant headaches that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with headaches. And at first, I obviously had watched Grey's Anatomy and House and all these medical shows. So my mind went to the worst possible, like, uh, diagnosis of like, oh, my goodness, he must have a brain tumor. So I remember, like, going to the doctor and telling him the history. And he was like, that sounds a little unusual. Like, it's probably not that. Let me go talk to him. So we went to talk to him and then realized that this boy couldn't see properly, like he needed glasses and he was getting headaches because he was straining so much. 
And then we were able to provide those glasses for him at the clinic. You know, we gave him a pair of glasses that tested his eyesight, gave him a pair of glasses. And I keep, could keep thinking about that boy is probably an adult now. And, and he, I wonder what his future now looks like because he got glasses at six, you know, how did that impact how he, how well he did at school, how he was, his ability to learn. And then how did that impact his future, like his life now? Um, and just to realize that like, you can make a small difference. Like you don't have to make a huge change. Like it's like putting on a pair of glasses so he could see, and then probably like his reading comprehension improved his ability to, um, his grades, his grades and everything. What did, what did that look like in terms of opportunity in the long term? It would have been a cool case study to do, but I Absolutely. obviously like didn't think of it at the time. And, and that felt meaningful to me. And that's when I decided, okay, may, maybe I do want to do medical school. And then I started to pursue that path um, and obviously pursued it and did it. Um, but then during medical school, I absolutely loved everything. Like I loved all the different specialties, did residency and burnt out during residency. This is a long story short. And that's when I tried to reconnect with my sense of purpose, went to Uganda to do some volunteer work. And it was amazing in a lot of ways because I was able to be more resourceful as a doctor and be a bit more creative in the way I practice because of the resource constraint settings that I was in. Um, but there was something still missing. I just felt like um, when we are burnt out, we bring ourselves along wherever we go, you know? And it's like, how do I, um, what Uganda gave me was a space um, of quiet contemplation where I like the outside distractions and voices were like no longer there. So I could like maybe listen to myself a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of have this phrase now, it's like, Oh, when I feel a bit like overwhelmed by uh, external voices, I always like think to myself, like, just take yourself back to Uganda. And I can do that mentally to that space of like quiet where I can like hear my own voice and then act from that place. So I, I did that and I was going to take some time off and go to New Zealand afterwards, after some like months of traveling, this was all pre-pandemic. Um, but then I ended up getting this offer at Harvard um, to do a master's in medical education and I decided to take it. And that's, I always tell people like I took a break from medicine to go to Harvard to do grad school. Um, and what it provided me was just space and time for introspection. And then that, that coincided with the pandemic, which amplified that process for me mm -hmm. in a big way, like it did for many people. And, and that's where I came across Ron Heifetz, um, the author, one of the authors of leadership on the line. Um, so I took a bunch of his courses. I took two of the leadership courses at the Kennedy school and they completely destabilized me in the best way possible in that like they really shook me in that like what is your sense of purpose and what is um what's your role within a system what's like how do systems work um and it gave me a different perspective on leadership that i'd never heard before and i just remember feeling like where is this framework in healthcare systems mm. like we could really use this in healthcare systems because it's missing if we use this, we would like be a lot further. And yeah. so that's, that really started this whole introspective, uh, contemplative process for me that, um, changed the trajectory of my career. Hey, but I can take a guess, but does it make sense from your childhood that this is what you're doing today? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, no, I've had to hold a lot of disappointment from family members and, um, from mentors as well. Like I was a excellent doctor, you know, and I, I loved my job. I was good at it. And, and I think it felt like a loss to some of my mentors. That I didn't go back and also to my family, my, especially my mom, uh, my dad passed away now. So, you know, I, I I'm sure I'd like to believe that he would be supportive of me, but, um, you know, we'll just, uh, yeah. So my mom, my mom is definitely disappointed that I have gone through medical school, gone through residency and then 
decided to do a 180 and go into something um, a little less predictable or a lot less predictable and kind of forge my own path that isn't like a clear cut, as clear cut as medicine or isn't as foreseeable as some of the trajectory that like, uh, like you said, with the job security of, of like, what that looks like because I'm making my own path forward and it's not as obvious as. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. There isn't, there isn't really a ladder that you can point to of security. It's kind of like you're designing it as you go. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm responsible for a lot of things now that I didn't have the same responsibility, for example, like as a doctor, even though I had a lot of responsibility for people's lives, um, I didn't have responsibility for the way the system worked, you know, like I was just an employee within a healthcare system. So I didn't need to worry about like um, budgets and, and like uh, from where I was, like my role, I wasn't the medical director or, you know. Yeah. It's like the front know. lines versus behind the scenes. Yeah. So I didn't like, I, I wasn't in a leadership position where I needed to worry about the entire system. I was just an employee in a system where I knew I was going to get a paycheck if I like went to work and did the expected work that was, I was being paid to do. Whereas now as an entrepreneur, everything from creating content to um, budgeting to creating programs, everything is on me. And if I don't do one part of it, it's like my responsibility. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's just like a different kind of responsibility. Hey, but what is relationship, uh, leadership, excuse me, what does leadership mean to you? Uh, so I love the term leadership because it's like, for me, it's like, I always say like, it's about exercising leadership. It's like a verb, right? Like, it's like when people talk about leaders all the time, I don't really, um, I don't subscribe to the term leader, to be honest, because a leader is a noun and it, it like, I can't say I'm a leader in, I can't say I'm a leader right now because to say that about myself, is like, it's almost like a leader needs to be almost nominated by the people that they're leading, right? Like I, leadership is a, is a verb. Like if leadership is an exercise that we have to do and that it's a practice that we, that we do. So in order to move things forward, we have to do something like and take an action. So um, that's why I don't really subscribe to the word leader, like as a noun, because it's just a person. Like it's just we're describing like that. rather than like an action. And I've leadership. Never, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. Leadership is just an action to me. Like, yeah. So that's. What, 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 do you want to feed something back? No, I, I like that. I, I I don't really think I've ever thought about it that way, but yeah. You're right. I, I agree with your assessment. All right. Yeah. So Almost an, oh, go ahead. So to me, it's like uh, anyone can exercise leadership. You don't need to be in a leadership position to do it. We all have leadership capacity within us. And it's like when it comes to an organization or a particular issue, it's usually like just really identifying what is the issue that we're trying to solve for and then how can I exercise leadership in order to um, impact this particular issue? And yeah, I think it's like kind of nuanced. I think about leadership as kind of like a systemic kind of um, process of like, what is my role within this particular system? And then there's the internal system and the external system. So the internal system is like, like my own how am I showing up in the world in order to exercise leadership? And what are the things that are helping me? And what are the things that are preventing me from exercising leadership in a, in a, an effective way? And then really trying to understand the internal landscape of who I am as a person. And then what are the things that um, activate me and limit my leadership capacity? And then Good what word I activate? I like that. Yeah. And then what are the things I can do about that when I realize I'm being activated in a certain identity, for example, um, to hold myself through something so that I'm not taking things personally and I become the issue instead of the issue I'm trying to solve. 
So that's like the internal part of it. And then the external part is realizing that we live in ecosystems. Like we're not living in isolation. I'm only one part of an ecosystem and I need to work together with other people in order to solve a common cause or an issue that we care about or want to make an impact on. And so what is my role? What are my strengths? What can I bring to the table that is going to help move this issue forward in a way that is about the issue and not about me and my ego? I love that. It was, so yeah, let's jump into the book. Can you introduce the book, um, the book that you want to share uh, and why you why you read it, why, why what the book means to you, what you've gotten from it? Mm -hmm. There's um, so the book I uh, want to share is called Leadership on the Line, and it's the subtitle is Staying Alive Through the Dangers of Leading. And um, it's written by Ronald Heifetz, who was my professor, and I ended up working with him at Harvard and Marty Linsky. Um, and they co-created or they co-founded this idea of adaptive leadership. And it talks about, um, they've written many books on this topic and I've had, to, to be honest, this was like required reading for my class <laughs> when I was a student. And then I read it multiple times because I also now teach this stuff. And um, this idea of adaptive leadership is, is all about, um, they're like that problems in the world are more complex than they appear. And we often try to apply technical solutions to an adaptive problem. So uh, the difference between an adaptive challenge and a technical challenge is that an adaptive challenge is complex and has many different solutions. Um, and it requires us to do a lot more learning. So we have to ask a lot of questions and it's kind of solved through curiosity and requires a lot of diagnostic integrity in order to come up with experiments to test to solve the issue. Um, and it doesn't require expertise. It requires uh, a stakeholder analysis. So it requires kind of identifying who all the different stakeholders are and then coming up with experiments to test to see if they will work to solve this complex issue. Whereas a technical challenge is um, like, it's not to say technical challenges are easy, they can be complex also, but they have a very clear cut solution. So for example, if if um, I'm driving my car and the, the engine breaks, like I don't need to go and, and um, survey, I don't know, the other drivers on the road and ask them like what's wrong with my car if i see the like engine light on i'll just take it to a mechanic because they're the expert that's going to be able to solve this problem it might be a complex issue with the engine but i know that the mechanic has the right expertise to solve that issue you know um so the the solution is more clear cut it might not be easy but it's clear cut and requires an expert to solve it and what we often see in the world is we are often trying to apply technical solutions to adaptive problems. <laughs> so then it ends up being like putting a Band-Aid on someone who needs surgery. Yeah, there's no innovation of thinking. There's no evolution of thinking. It's just kind of doing what's always been done. Yeah, or, or applying the wrong solution because you haven't learned enough about the problem. Hey, but when... In your various readings of the book, what what was it that you took away? What was it that stood out? What was that aha moment or message from the book that really made you choose this book, that really opened up your eyes to what leadership out in the world with issues in the workplace, what that could look like? Yeah. What I love about this particular book, Leadership on the Line, versus the other books that um, they've written, and they're all excellent, by the way. I recommend all of them. Um, what I like about this one is it really lays out the internal landscape, you know, like it's like it I've never heard like maybe it's because I hadn't been in these spaces before, but like um, their big thing is like to lead is to live dangerously, you know, because often uh, to to lead means to ask people to uh, sustain losses certain stakeholders have to sustain losses. And that's usually where the resistance comes to change. 
it's like when we are asking for things to change, we're often asking a subset or different factions to sustain losses. And then that becomes resistance, right? And so often if I'm the person coming and being like, we need to make this change in this organization or on this issue, then it might feel like I'm posing a threat to a certain set of stakeholders. And then it can feel like um, one of the reactions I might get because I'm the messenger is like, we need to get rid of her. You know, like they'll assassinate the messenger. Um, and it's like, how do you stay alive when people are trying to not sustain the losses that you're asking them to sustain? And how do you um, not take things personally? You know? Yeah. And well, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, you go. No, I was just going to say just that idea of, um, you know, that people may think that life, um, work, business is zero sum. Uh, it's in our DNA just to kind of get for us, not have taken away from us. So it's very fear based. So yeah. that, that's what stands out to me as you were as you were mentioning when you're asking someone else to su sustain losses, even if it means that in the end we're both going to win. That temporary loss of sustenance. Um, again, people are already already fearful that they're going to have something taken away from them. So when you are asking them to sustain sustain some kind of loss, it just makes perfect perfect sense. I think we've seen that so much in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Politics, global politics, global issues. Where, um, yeah, there are different sides, different stories, different um, requests. Um, so it just shows, I, I, I like that it shows that side of leadership, that side of leadership development and, and the fostering of the environment, um, what, what role fear plays in it. Yeah. And I, I think, I think the thing I love about this book is it actually, um, talks a lot about our internal environment. Like, how is it that I'm showing up in the world? Um, and how is that impacting, like, my whole life whether professionally or personally and it's really identifying the identities the loyalties the hungers we have for validation belonging intimacy um and significance you know and really understanding the internal landscape of who we are as people and how is that impacting the way i show up to work every day or how does it impact my ability to listen to certain people or you know Hey, but that little list that you just gave, is that like the chapters? Is that the sections of the book? Um, I don't have or, the book with me right now, but, okay. I, and, but I mean, yes, those are definitely in the book. Like they, those ideas are in the book of, um, yeah, like how do our identities inform how we show up in the world, who we listen to, how do our loyalties do that, you know, um, and I can give specific examples to that. And, and then the, definitely the hungers are in the book too. It's like the hungers for significance. These are all normal hungers. As human beings, we want to feel significant in the world. We, we need validation. We need to feel a sense of belonging and we need intimacy. But it's just when, when these things are, when these hungers are exaggerated, they become dangerous in the way that we show up in the world. An yeah. example of that could be seen in history. We've seen like, what the exaggerated hunger for intimacy can do in in certain workplaces or in politics like with bill clinton for example we that's a very public example of like that exaggerated hunger for intimacy can lead you to make um decisions that are not wise for the work that you're doing and so it kind of talks about how like managing your hungers so that you can actually lead from a place of of um integrity and and wholeness and like it's really important to take care of these like when we feel this exaggerated need for power then our need for power becomes more important than our need to lead you know and we've seen that in politics too <laughs> yeah can you give a couple more examples um well, the power thing, we, we can kind of see what happened four years ago with Trump when when um, when he lost the election. But then there was all this talk about and then we saw January 6th happen, you know, of like all this talk of no, it, the, like 
um, this election didn't count, blah, blah, blah. You know, all this, all, all these theories of like, but it's not in the best interest of for democracy, for example, to do that because it was a, an election and people voted, you got a result you didn't like, but then to try and maintain power, you try to um, like do whatever it takes to maintain power rather than, than um, do what's right by people who are, which is like the president of the United States is being authorized to provide a service for the constituents and for the people that are voting for him or her. Um, and their role as president is to serve those people. And that's the expectation by authorizing someone through our votes, but then to care about being staying in power. And we see that in politics across the world. You know, it's not just here, but we saw it here recently in the last four years. And then we see that in governments that are corrupt, where there's like, um, where, you know, people maintain power over like, actually doing the work that they're being authorized to do um hey but in reading the book um what changed in you like mm -hmm. how how sensitive were you to those kind of dynamics afterwards did anything change about the way you operated in your different circles your different yeah. ecosystems after reading this i love this question um and yes 100 <laughs> percent. so i'm palestinian I grew up in a Palestinian refugee family and and I I grew up in the West mostly. I, I I had some I lived in the Middle East for a little bit as a child, but most of my time was spent in the Western world. Like from nine years old onwards, I was living in the Western world. And there was a lot of like complexity with that as an immigrant and as a as a person who's ethnically like from an Arab family and especially Palestinian. Like there's a lot of stigma or, or growing up the way that Western media has, has defined what Palestinian is, is different than my experience of what it means to be Palestinian, for example. So in order to fit in in a Western world, there were definitely moments in my life where I hid my Palestinian identity because I didn't want to be uh, associated as a um, terrorist or, you know, that was the way that Western media portrayed Palestinians like for many, many years, things are shifting now with the, uh, with everything, the current war happening there and everything ongoing in that part of the world right now, things, you know, I, I feel, and I'm almost shocked <laughs> to see like a change in the narrative. And, you know, I'm grateful too, because um, it's a, a lot more nuanced, right? Like, it's it's to say a whole people is a certain way is wrong it's not the right thing to like there are always um yeah anyway so like i i what i what i noticed after reading this book and taking this class is despite the fact that i tried to hide my palestinianness in the world like overtly it showed up in the world overtly or unconsciously in many, many different ways. Every time I saw an injustice, like whether in patient care or um, in the world, I would lose my sense of curiosity because I would just be so binary about the way right and wrong. You know, I would stop listening to certain people if I felt like they were um, causing the injustice. I didn't have the compassion to listen to them if I felt that way. And that comes from being Palestinian, you know, or like mm -hmm. that Palestinian identity is like, we've, we've witnessed a lot of injustice in our history. In my ancestry, my dad is a refugee. Like I have first, I'm just one generation away from the refugee experience. So it's not to say like, and then, so for example, like, um, there was an incident when in residency where I didn't get paid for three months and I had rent to pay. I needed to get to work on a train. It was costing me like 500 pounds a month to travel and all this stuff. Like, but I wasn't getting paid properly for three months and I tried to uh, rectify the situation, but it didn't like people just kept kind of putting me off and being like, what do you need the money for? And I'm like, part of my contract <laughs> doesn't matter what I need the money for like it's part of my contract 
we signed a contract. You said you were going to pay me X amount of money. You're not paying me that money for this number for in exchange for the service I'm providing. And you're not, you're not like upkeeping your part of the contract. And it became this huge thing where I just didn't get paid for three months and neither did the other three residents or, or like that I was working with at the time. None of us were getting paid the right amount. We were getting paid a third of our, our paycheck and like the other two thirds were unaccounted for. And I tried to like rectify the situation in like um, in a lot of ways by asking questions, by contacting HR, payroll, my supervisor, all these things. But everyone was kind of like just shutting the door on me and being like, well, you know, it's not your problem, whatever. To the point where like I felt like there was so much injustice in all of this. And it is. It's true. Like you don't need to be Palestinian to realize the injustice in, in this. But um, I lost curiosity for like certain reactions that I was getting. So instead of being more curious about like why, why is everyone shutting me down? Why are people not taking me seriously? Like, why is this not whatever? I didn't have the capacity to ask those questions that I needed to ask um, because I just saw it as right or wrong, you know? Yeah. And I didn't have the capacity to question what's happening within the system um, because I just saw it as like unjust. Like, um, so that's like one way. And, and then it's like certain people obviously... Um, yeah, like activate a certain identity or threaten a certain identity. Um, for example, it was like men telling me, like I was talking to a lot of men who shut me down. And so like my identity as a woman was threatened mm -hmm. and, and my identity as a professional woman was threatened because I'm like, how, like there's that power dynamic historically. And then I was experiencing it personally. And then like, you know, you tend to like lose your sense of curiosity and things like that. So it's just like being aware of the identities that we hold and then realizing that when I feel a certain way, when I'm being activated in a certain way, when my blood pressure is going up, when I feel the heat in my face, when my heart rate's racing and I want to like yell yeah. at someone, really taking a moment to just be like, okay, what's being threatened right now in this moment? And it's like, oh, it's this identity mm -hmm. of the world. It's this identity as a professional woman. It's my, it's my identity as a Palestinian. It's my identity as this. And then, like learning how to manage that activation before making the next move, which is usually should come out as a question, you know, rather than yeah. like point the finger and say you're wrong, you're you're unfair, you're this. It's like how can I maintain my sense of curiosity? to maintain my diagnostic integrity in this moment, despite my activation. Oof. Perfectly said. Perfectly said. I think it is, you know, tapping into that wherewithal to stop yourself from reacting, um, to get to what is being activated and then, you know, diagnosing it and then moving from there. So that's, that's amazing. Um, and I think we've, we've, there's a talk of emotional intelligence all over the place, but I think this gives it another dimension based on the different hats that you're wearing, depending on which one is activated. So I think it gives it, again, that nuance. I think what we've lost in this world in conversations is nuance. Nothing is black and white. Uh, so I appreciate you bringing up just the issues that are at hand and then the nuance that that play into them. Yeah, but yeah. do you see? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, the other piece of it is, uh, recognizing that um, there are certain people that we authorize, like, especially I, I'm going to, I am going to talk about Israel, Palestine just for a second, because there's like, right now there's so much polarization that if you are Arab, for example, it's really hard to listen to an Israeli and vice versa. And there's so much mistrust and distrust in the, between people. Right. And people feel like they have to pick a side. Like, this side yeah. can't be like they can't both be right so i must pick a side and i'm seeing that sense of loyalty even amongst friends who are not arab and non-israeli who are feeling like they have friends who are both and they're like i don't know whose side to pick you know and there's like too much sensitivity around yeah. choosing a side or having like there's no room for two truths to ex exist at the same time you know yeah. And this is kind of like the the landscape right now, but it's just like, and the reason why that happens is because of the loyalties we hold. 
these internal loyalties we hold. So like, for example, what does it mean for an Arab to listen to an Israeli or to, to even question them or have compassion towards them and vice versa? It means like maybe going against um, the loyalty of your ancestors of yeah. like people who suffered. So for example, I, t I taught Israeli uh, soldiers, you know, at Harvard, I taught them in my classrooms. And, and it's like, if I was limited in my ability to hear them speak or to learn from them or to be open to them, which, you know, I've had to renegotiate some of the loyalties I had to my ancestors because they suffered under Israeli regime. You know, they, they were kicked out of their homes and had to take refuge and live in refugee camps. But if I if I if I am so loyal to my ancestors suffering, there's no space for us moving forward in in our ability to work towards a solution that's viable. You know? So at some point I had to do an internal renegotiation of to to like put the to lay the past to rest or to set the waters down that I'm carrying from generations before me in order to even begin to imagine or dream of a way forward for this cause, which I really deeply care about, you know? And so, but that requires me to hold space and to mm. listen to someone whose point of view is so different than mine. Yeah. Um, there's just so many, and this is a very obviously uh, important conversation to have. And I think any topic that's out there, any topic that gets to the top of the news cycle gets hijacked where what you're saying doesn't occur. Um, it's just like the same old cyclical thinking, um, you know, uh, self-preservation out of fear, of course, uh, anger, of course, um, I do. I think I do want to have you back for another conversation so we can dive into that just because mm. I think that applies to so many different areas of life. Obviously, it's tied to your family, your traditions, your heritage. But I think that's I think the the topic of nuance um, is just so important that I'd love to have you back for another conversation where we can dig into that. Yeah. So I know we are like at time and we've t i've spoken so much and yeah no 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 it's it's all right i i don't want you to think that i'm just saying that to go no, 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 I, I, really I really do i really do want to have that conversation because i think that's what's missing i think even when there are times where i want to be an ally depending whatever the topic may be this side versus that side and i want to be an ally i get turned off in the conversation because i hear that just one-sided there's no nuance it's black and white Mm -hmm. Um, so I've stepped away from conversations. I've stepped into a virtual room where a conversation was supposed to take place and it was just all kind of one-sided, uh, where people came to learn and then were admonished for not agreeing with one side or the other. So I think nuance is very important. And that's why I want to have that conversation about that power of nuance. So this may be a first where we don't bring you back for a, a book to talk about, but a continuation of that topic of nuance. So if you'll come back, I'd love to have you. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to be there. Thank you. And until that next episode, the book that Hiba uh, covered today was Leadership on the Line, Staying Alive Through the Dangers of Leading. Um, and thank you, Hiba, for sitting down and for agreeing to come back for another conversation on nuance. I think that's like the major topic that I want to cover these days. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. If there's anything I might have missed, there's so much to cover, let me know, and I'll send him a message uh, and gain some more insight, wisdom, anything she might be able to share. In the meantime, thank you for watching and listening, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.